Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So um, some of you know this, but I met my wife the first day of college. It's a cute story, I know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we started dating freshman year. Uh, when you're a freshman in college, you don't really have many options for dates. So my wife, Lauren, suggested that we go swimming in the athletic pool on campus. Uh, and I had a vague memory of hating swimming, but I couldn't remember why. Um, but I had a strong memory of wanting to impress her with my athletic prowess. Um, I actually wasn't really good. I was in great shape back then. I had run a marathon recently. I was on our college cross country team. Um, and so I figured I'd hop in the pool. I'd show, I'd show her what swimming looked like. Um, that's not how it turned out. Um, we get in the pool, she throws on her goggles, and she doesn't swim as much as she like hovers over the water in this beautiful freestyle um, flying back and forth. And I, I would call what I did a dignified doggy paddle, except there was nothing dignified about it. It was horrible. It was me pushing the pool as I was trying to move forward, and she's just passing me back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And about 15 minutes into this, I realized this relationship is over. <laughs> there is no way she's going to stay with me after this horrible performance in the pool. So I get out of the pool, lamenting the end of the relationship. Fast forward, and um, here we are, <laughs> right? Some many years later. Uh, and we have two kids. We have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. And I am still the worst swimmer in my family. All of which is to say, when you get to this week's Torah portion, Parshat Noach with the floody floody, <laughs> if those waters start to rise, I'm the first one to go. <laughs> right? Because in this Torah portion, God sends a flood. The most well-known Torah portion there is. God sends a flood, and God says to Noah, I, I am about to destroy all life on earth. And sure enough, that's what happens. The rains start to fall, and they keep falling, and they keep falling. Anybody know how long? 40 days and 40 nights, and the waters rise, and they rise, and they rise above the highest, highest mountains in the world, and it is just water. Uh, and then the water stays for a year, for a year, and then the waters recede, and the ark lands, and Noah does something really interesting. Our Torah portion calls Noah a tiller of soil, and as he steps off the ark, you know what he does? He plants a vineyard. He plants a vineyard, and as the Torah continues, and I'll spare with you the somewhat X-rated part, um, he, he, he drinks of the vineyard uh, and gets drunk. And he's not drinking as uh, one might enjoy a drink or two before our uh, Friday night services here at Washington Hebrew. There is a two-drink limit here at Washington Hebrew. There was not a two-drink limit for Noah. And I say this because um, Noah drank uh, not in a joyful way. Um, but he was, a, he was a sad drunk, if you can say such a thing. You can certainly say such a thing. Um, he was a desperate drunk. He was a blackout, run away from what was in front of him kind of drunk. And I share this because you'd think he'd be happy. After all, there are eight survivors of the flood. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That's it. There were, according to biblical scholars who I don't often read, other than to quote some numbers that are interesting, I'll just share them with you. Our scholars say that there were seven billion people who died in the flood. There were eight survivors, which makes Noah's odds of surviving the flood about one, I did the math, one in 875 million. Now, for perspective's sake, if you win a Powerball, that is a one in 300 million chance. So why is Noah so... Um, upset, overwhelmed, after a one-third as likely chance of winning the Powerball, surviving the flood. And as I thought about this question of why Noah ran away from what was in front of him, I want you, and we're going to do this together, um, to enter into what Noah saw. So we're going to do something. Go with me for a minute. I want you all to close your eyes, and I want you to see what Noah saw through his own eyes. So you are now Noah, and the gangplank of the ark is going down, and it touches ground. You walk down, and your feet, for the first time in a year, are on solid earth. And you look down at your sandals, and you see dust and mud. You look ahead of you. Stay with me, eyes closed. And you see dust 
and mud. You look to your left, and as far as the eye can see, you see dust and mud. You look to the right, and as far as the eye can see, you see dust and mud. You turn around to the ark, and beyond the ark, all you see is dust and mud. And now open your eyes for a minute, because you are Noah now, and you realize that you could be where you are or a thousand miles in any direction, and all there is left is dust and mud. This beautiful, green, alive planet is gone, and it's just death and destruction. Noah was overwhelmed, and he ran away. He ran away from it all. And I share this because um, I am feeling, as I know you all are, welcome to the nation's capital, that sense of overwhelm in this Shabbat leading up to the election. Is that right? That sense of overwhelm, because if you are like me, actually, let's just do a show of hands. Has anybody here in the past 48 hours read a news article that said that this is the most consequential election of your lifetime, of our nation? Raise your hand. That's everybody, hands down. Great. And so it's not just a most consequential election, but if you have an issue that you care about or issues that you care, that you care about, it feels like they are all on the line right now, right? I'm going to give a bipartisan list. It's very important, right? Whether you care about um, uh, immigration or inflation or environment or reproductive rights uh, or, or, or the economy, whatever it might be, it's all on the line right now. And uh, so what do you do? What do you do? Y you vote. Has anybody here voted in, in this election already? Oh my gosh, look at you, hands down. Hands down, yeah, me too. So, so I voted um, uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, and I, I, always, I learned this the hard way in my first uh, election cycle at Washington Hebrew, because as a rabbi in Cantor's too, you can't always control your schedule on any given day. Uh, and so I've been voting by mail, and I voted by mail yet again um, uh, about a week and a half ago. And so uh, the ballot came in, <clears throat> And, uh, and I read the instructions very clearly. Essentially, fill out a bubble, right? And so um, I got my pen, and I opened it, and I filled out that bubble. And then I read the instructions again, because I really wanted to vote, right? And, and it, they did not change, right? Fill out the bubble, and I made sure that bubble was, it was, ex it was extra black, and I, there was no ink outside the line, right? It was totally full. This vote was going to count. And that's it. That's it. Which was such a surreal feeling. You probably felt this when you were voting, right? There were billions of dollars poured in to you filling out that bubble over this election cycle, right? Thousands of hours for each of us reading the news, fretting about the news, trying to understand what is happening around it. Thousands of hours all going into you filling out that bubble. Isn't that crazy that the most incredible form of government democracy that human beings have ever come up with depends on you opening a pen and filling in some ink? It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. It reminds me of a quote, actually. Are any of you here in 12 Jewish Questions, uh, this current cohort? We got one, two. So on Monday, we studied this text. When Ben Azai, the great sage of his generation 2,000 years ago, he says to run to do an easy mitzvah, as you would, do you remember? A difficult one. Run to do an easy mitzvah, as you would a what? A difficult one. Now, you might think that the great sage of his generation, Ben Azai, would instead be telling his students, guys, we have big mitzvahs to do. We have world-transforming things that we have to get done. That's not what Ben Azai says. Ben Azai says to run to do an easy mitzvah as you would to do a big one. And as I'm thinking about this very strange commandment, I actually thought of my own college graduation. At my college graduation, I actually don't know if this was what was said, but this is what's said at every college graduation, every high school graduation. You are the leaders of the world. Go out and change the world, right? And then you go out and instead of changing the world, because you don't have a job yet, you go home and you sleep in your parent in, in your in your childhood bedroom for as long as your parents will let you, right? I'm seeing some nods. And as you are tucking yourself into your childhood sheets, wondering why no one is 
um, hiring a political science major, all 22 years old, to change the world, um, you might be wondering, what am I doing with myself? What am I doing with my days? What am I doing with my life? What is this adding up to in the end of the day? And I gotta tell you, if you're, if you're young and you're still living in your parents' house, that's fine. I've had in my office, I probably have on a, on a given year, two dozen of these conversations. And it's not just recent college grads. I've had people in my office who are celebrated lawyers, doctors, uh, and CEOs who are all asking the essential question, I've been doing whatever I'm doing for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I'm retired, and I don't know the point of this. I don't know why I am here. I'm on the other side of decades of career, of accomplishment, and I don't know why. And if you've ever asked this question, I want to... <laughs> conclude in a way with the realization that maybe you are not actually going to change the world. Maybe the world is too big and too wild and too chaotic and too out of your control for you to do any mitzvah, no matter how big, that is going to change it. And if this is too upsetting for you, I want to share that maybe the world was never in your control. Maybe the world has always been beyond your ability to shape it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because I don't want any of you, I don't want any of us to be remembered for just one thing. That's a nightmare and a terror in and of itself. And I don't really have an answer for what you do when you realize, as I hope we are all there, that you are not going to change the world. When you ask the question, what's the point of these years, what's the point of my life? Why am I here? I'm not gonna give you an answer, but I am going to give you an additional word to the question. I'm gonna extend the wisdom of Ben Azai for just a moment. Instead of asking, why am I here? I want you to ask, why am I here today? Instead of asking, what's the point of my life? I want you to ask, what's the point of my life today? Because there is never going to be a mitzvah big enough to define you. There's never going to be an act that will shape the rest of your life. Your life is going to be determined by a small thing on November 5th. Fill out that bubble. Your life is going to be determined by another small thing on November 6th, on November 7th, on November 8th, and fast forward through the thousands, please God, thousands and thousands of good days of your life. Each one of those days has its own purpose. Each one of those days has its own mitzvah. And when you fill your life with days of mitzvot, don't run to do a big one. Run to do even the smallest. Then I know that come the end of it all, that your life, please God, will be remembered for a blessing. Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos. Go inside your heart, just be. Go inside your heart and see what it wants, what it needs, what it yearns when you breathe. Go inside your heart.